Okay, so the question I will be talking about today is the following one. Can we justify the division of human being, you, me, right, Steve, um, into races, into distinct races, blacks, whites, Asians, and so on and so forth, on biological grounds? Is there a biological justification for distinguishing human beings into into races. So that's the question I'm going to be talking about today. Now, there's a sense in which the answer is obviously yes. Why? Well, as you know, I suppose, and if you don't know, you should know, as you know, in the US and in most places in the world, there are massive social and economic differences between races. Right? In the US, overall, black people are much poorer than white people. Latinos have a much lower socioeconomic status than Caucasians. And of course, these social differences, the differences between blacks and whites in the USA, have an impact on people's health and people's uh, uh, life expectancy. So for example, if you just look at this data here, black in the US have 50% more chance to die of a heart disease than white people. Uh, black also have about twice as much chance to die of cancer than a white person. And the life expectancy of a black person in the USA is about six years shorter than the life expectancy of a white person in the USA. Massive differences. And of course, these differences are biological, right? You know, wh whether you have uh, a cancer, it's a biological fact. So in some sense, for social reasons, blacks and whites have different biological properties, right? Blacks are more likely to have cancer than white people, and so on and so forth, right? So there are biological differences between races for social and economic reasons. But that's not the question I will be asking today. I won't be asking whether, uh, for social reasons, for economic reasons, there are differences, biological differences, between blacks, whites, Asians, Latinos, people, uh, uh, Native Americans. What I will be asking is another question. And the other question I will be asking is the following one. Can we divide human beings into races for the very same reasons we divide species, like dogs, cats, and so on and so forth, into smaller groups. So if you take dogs, for example, you can divide dogs into breeds, right? You've got uh, poodles, uh, a German shepherd, and bulldogs, right? And plenty of other breeds. And that's a biological division, right? We divide them on biological grounds, and this, div this biological division is not due to social factors. What I want to ask is, can we do the same thing for human beings? Are races, human races, blacks, whites, and whatever, Asians, are they in some sense equivalent to the breeds we find in other species? Now, if you look a bit at the history about that question, what you find is that many people for a very long time have answered, well, obviously, yes, right? Human races are quite, in some ways, similar to breeds in other species. So for example, in the 18th and 19th century, people in Europe and the USA were obsessed, and obsessed is just the right word, with classifying people into races. One of the most important books is by this German scientist called Blumenbach, and Blumenbach was the first one to divide humans into five races, Caucasian being at the center right there, and then you've got the five other races. You may not realize, but these skulls were meant to be quite different from one another and to stand for, for the different races. And Blumenbach was only one of many scientists who argued that yes, races are really distinct biological groups. In the USA, one of the most important anthropologists of the 19th century Sam Morton spent his, all, his whole life, really, his whole life collecting skulls. And if you go to, uh, I don't know, 
how many of you are into skulls? Probably very few of you, that's good. Uh, but if you go to Philly, the Philadelphia, the Museum of Anthropology, you can see many of the skulls that uh, Morton collected. And why did Morton collect skulls? Because he wanted to show that between the races, the skulls vary. That white people, Asian people, uh, uh, African people, and uh, Native Americans have different skulls because he thought, of course, that the size of your skull was related to how smart you were. So he was trying to say, look, there are fundamental biological differences in morphology and in intelligence between these biological groups, namely the races. Uh, and it's not, only, it's not simply about morphology. People thought that uh, for a very long time that races were biological groups and which had different morphologies, but also different psychological properties. Here is Yerkes, who I don't know whether you know, but it's one of the most influential American psychologists of the time. And here is what Yerkes writes in 1923. Um, the contrasting intellectual status of the white versus the negro constituents of the draft appear from table three. So that's table three. Few residents of the United States probably would have anticipated so great a difference that the American Negro is 90% illiterate only in part accounts for his inferior intellectual status. So it was very common wisdom for most of the last 200 years that blacks, white, Native Americans, and so on and so forth are distinct biological groups. And you can distinguish them by looking at their morphology, their skulls, and also by looking at their mind, how smart they are, how courageous they are, and so on and so forth. That's really, for a very long time, it has been the standard answer. And I would say, sadly, it is still, for many people, the common answer. So what you have here is one of the most influential books published in the last 30 years. Uh, it's Einstein and Murray, The Bell Curve, where Einstein and Murray look at IQ differences between races in the USA, and they argue that the differences we find between blacks, whites, and Asians are in part due to genetic differences. So they think there are genetic differences between races that explain why there are variation in IQ across races. All these people have the same view. Races are biological. They are very important because they explain differences in morphology, in intelligence, and so on and so forth. Right? I don't know how many of you have that view. Maybe some of you, maybe none of you, maybe many of you. It, and people, of, of course, even if they believe that, they may not be forthcoming, uh, expressing that view. But what I want to argue today is that that tradition is really deeply misguided. I hope you like the animation. I really find it really fancy. Right? So I want to say that view, you know, this 200 years of biological thinking about races, that should stop. I think we have now good science to believe that it's a very mistaken view about what races are. Races are not biological groups. And to just give you the summary, you know, if you fall asleep, you won't. But if you fall asleep, just in case, and you wake up in 50 minutes or 60 minutes, here's what you should remember, right? Now everybody's awake. There is no biological justification for distinguishing people into races. Does that mean there are no social justification, right? Historical, cultural, right? There may be other grounds for drawing distinctions between races, but the grounds are not biological, right? So that's, that's uh, uh, what I want you to remember from this talk. So as you can see right there, got a lot of things to tell you. The first thing I want to tell you, and hopefully I will be able to go through most of it, most of it's really easy. The only bit that's a little bit technical is number six, but most of it's really easy. So I want first to, to express the idea, well, this claim is really not obvious, right? The idea is that there are no biological grounds for races. Then we look at the idea that, well, the way we've been classifying people into races has changed a lot during history. Then we look at the idea that it's, in fact, very difficult to define races by looking at the phenotype. You know, by looking at skin color, body shape, it's very hard. And actually, it's almost impossible. Right? Then we'll move away from the phenotype, you know, the superficial properties, and we look at the genome. 
I don't know how much you know about genes, so I really give, will give you a very, very simple background about genes just to uh, refresh your memory in case uh, uh, you haven't taken biology for quite a while. And then we'll, we'll look at what we know about genetic variation among human beings, right? And we know now quite a lot, you know. And then I will explain how everything we know about genetic variation among human beings makes sense in light of the evolution of the human species, in light of what we know about how the human species evolved for 200,000 years. And then I'll, I'll conclude. All right, let's start with really. As I said, the main claim of this lecture is that there are no biological grounds for distinguishing human into races. And as I said, it goes against the tradition. And I also believe it goes against what most people intuitively believe. Why? Well, here's one reason. It seems obvious that there are races, right? Well, you know, you've got black people, and some are very good at basketball, some are amazing politicians, and some are Nobel Prize winners because they write some of the best novels ever. And then you've got white people, and some are very good at basketball, some are terrible politicians, and some, and, 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 and some are great scientists, like Marie Curie, you know. And so it seems to be intuitive that, well, what do you mean there are no biological grounds for distinguishing people into races? It's part of our phenomenology. It's obvious, right? You've got white, and you've got black, and you've got Asian, and they don't look the same, and firstly. So that's the first reason why one could be skeptical of that claim. Another reason is, well, look, if you look at medicine, racial classification are used all over the place in medicine. In fact, racial classifications are required these days in medical science. You can't do a medical study nowadays without classifying your subjects into races. How is that possible if races, what's the point of doing that if races have no biological meaning? Furthermore, you have drugs like the Bidil, which, are, which have been introduced in the USA only for black people. Right? So the Bidil is a drug for heart problem, introduced in 2005, I believe. Yeah, 2005. And it was introduced to help black people, not white people, not Asians, not Latinos, not Native Americans. Again, how is that possible if I'm right when I say races are not biological kinds? You know, it seems, to be, it seems to be puzzling. And a third reason is there seems to be some debate going on about whether races have a real biological meaning, right? So it seems, you know, I'm making an assertion, a bold claim, but am I backed by, by science? Right? So for these three reasons, the phenomenology, the phenomenology, it's intuitive, also it's used in medicine, and also there seems to be some debate among scientists no, it should be controversial whether races are biological. All right, that's, that's the beginning. Moving on. Here is a way we, well, I should say you guys, you Americans, uh, not being American, I can say that, uh, you people, here's one way you're dividing us, human beings, into, into races. So you roughly, you've got black people, people of African ancestry, including African American, then you have roughly white people, right? people of European ancestry. Then you have Asian people or people of Asian ancestry. Then uh, you have Pacific Islander or people in Australia, Aboriginals in Australia. And then uh, roughly you have uh, Native Americans and Indians. You have these uh, intuitive classifications of people into these kinds of, this, into these races. It's a official, commonsensical folk classification into races nowadays in the USA. Um, now, the first thing I want you to realize is that that classification has in, is, in fact, very parochial. It's local. It's, it's a classification you guys are endorsing. But people at other times in other places have classified people into races in very different ways. Right? So you should not assume that your way of classify, distinguishing races, you know, people of African origin, people of Asian origin, people of European origin, that way of classifying into races is universal. That would be really silly. 
it would be a mistake. So let's look back at the 19th century. What you have here are three of the main books written about racers in the 19th century. They're horribly, horribly, let me repeat, horribly racist. Uh, it's just unbelievable. So Gobineau, uh, Essay sur l'inégalité des races humaines, so Essay on the inequality of uh, uh, racial races, uh, a French aristocrat, then you've got uh, Chamberlain, born in the UK, moved to Germany, had a huge influence on, on Adolf Hitler, wrote uh, the foundations of the 19th century, and then early 20th century in the USA, Madison, uh, Grant, Madison Grant wrote his very influential book, The Passing of the Great Race. All these books are concerned with two things, distinguishing races and explaining history by means of the conflict, the fight between races. The important thing about that is they don't care very much about black and white. The point is not black and white. The debate, the whole book is about different races of white people. They don't believe that whites are a single race. Rather, they usually draw distinction within whites among two, three, or four races. Here's the way Madison Grant, uh, um, the American racist writer, distinguished races. You have in Europe three races. You've got the dominant, the great race, which are Nordic people. Right? Then you have what other people have called the Slav, but what um, um, uh, uh, Madison Grant calls the Alpine people. And then you've got the Medi Mediterranean people. Here, what you see is for Grant, just like for Gobineau and just like for Chamberlain, the racial distinctions are not really about black and white. They're really about different types of, of white people. Right? So you should not assume that your idea that whites are a race was universal. It's actually a recent development, a recent invention. Another way to make the point is to look at the Irish people. How many of you are of, of, of Irish, of, of Irish ascendancy here? OK, do you call yourself white? Yeah, you do. Well, here's the way people thought about your ancestor about 100 year, 150 years ago. So you had the white people who were English, right, or Teutonic, the Nordic race. You had the, uh, uh, what, what used to be called Negroes, African, African people, people of African ancestry. And you had an, a third race, which was not viewed as being white, but which was, as you can see, somehow a mix between the African race and the anglo teutonic race. So for most of the 19th century, Irish people were not thought as being white people. It's in fact a very recent invention. And if you have interest in Irish history, as many Americans do, I highly recommend that book by Ignatieff that explains how the Irish became white. How at the end of the 19th century, mostly for social and political reasons, Irish people that were thought to be non-white suddenly were included as, as being white. Right? Again, what we see is changes in racial classifications throughout history. What's the upshot? Well, racial classifications vary across times. They also vary across spaces, across countries. And what's the consequence? Well, this fact casts doubts on whether they reflect genuine biological distinctions. Right? They seem to be really labile. They seem to be more reflecting social facts, historical facts, rather than biological facts. Right? OK, that's, that's an important point to keep in mind for the remainder of the lecture. Now, you could respond that, OK, fine. The distinction between the Nordic people, the Alpine people, the Mediterranean people, that was mistaken. That's purely social. There's no biological grounds for drawing that distinction. But the distinction we, and by we, I mean you, Americans endorse, now endorse, namely blacks, Asians, white, Native Americans, that distinction is grounded or does track genuine biological classifications. You may say people were wrong in the past, but at least that distinction is actually very reasonable on biological grounds. All right. So what we've seen so far, we've seen that, well, it's a little bit surprising to say that races are not biological. We've seen that one reason to support that claim, to believe in that claim, is, well, look, the way we've been distinguishing people into races has been changing across times. 
it seems to be more a social phenomenon rather than a biological one. I want now to turn to the question of how easy is it to distinguish people into races. The issue is how can we divide people into races when one considers people's phenotype, right? the way people look? How easy is that? And usually, the answer is fairly easy. Right? You know, takes a black person, like Obama, for example, or maybe Mandela, take a white person, um, uh, like Marie Curie, for example. Well, you know, one is black and the other is white, so there seems to be some differences that we can use to distinguish races. Um, but as you can see, as you will see, for three reasons, the answer is it's very difficult to use superficial properties to distinguish races. Here's the first reason. There's a huge amount of phenotypic variation within races. Just consider, for example, morphology. What you have here is uh, uh, Gabriel Assier, who I guess you know, he's a very famous uh, uh, racer, uh, race uh, long distance racers, probably one of the best in, in history. What you have here is Hussein Bolt. Hussein Bolt comes, his family comes from the west part of Africa. Gabriel Assier comes from the east part of Africa. And as you can see, uh, people in the east part of Africa and people of the west part of Africa, West Africa, or whose ancestry comes from the west part of Africa, they've got very different morphologies. Right? Their body are not at all the same. People in the east part of Africa are thinner, they're smaller, they're denser. People in the west part of Africa tend to be taller, tend to have larger body, and so on and so forth. Furthermore, it's not only the growth, the large morphology, which varies across uh, uh, within race. When you look at the muscles of people in the east part of Africa, the muscles in the leg, people in the east part of Africa, people in the west part of Africa, they don't have the same fibers in their leg muscles, which explains why people in the west part of Africa or whose ancestry comes from the west part of Africa, are good in short races, 100 meters. People in the, west part, in the east part of Africa, different fibers in their leg, much better in long, in long races. Right? So there's a tremendous variation within any race. Now you may say, OK, what about skin color? Well, here is two people who are white. I guess you don't know that guy. He's uh, Oli Khan. You don't know him for two reasons. First, you're American. Second, you're too young. He used to be the goalkeeper of the German soccer team, was one of the best goalkeepers ever. He's really white. Uh, I mean, you know, he's kind of pale, actually, sickly pale, let's say. Uh, but he's German and French, you know. <laughs> Long history of going at each other. Uh, here is also another white dude, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. He's Portuguese. He's one of the best players of his generation. He's a white guy, but as, as you can see, the skin color isn't exactly the same, right? I mean, this one is much paler than the other one, right? There's tremendous variation in what being white really means. So you can't really use skin color. There's, there's variation in uh, uh, the skin color. And you would find people we classify as black who are paler than Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo. OK, there's tremendous variation uh, on a phenotypic level. The second reason is our distinction between races are categorical. Right, you're either black or white. It's dichotomous, for example, for black and white. Right? But if you look at phenotypic variation, it's always graded. It's continuous. Right? So for example, skin color here varies continuously from the darker hue to the paler hue. Right? There's no point where this variation, in a sense, changes in a, in a, uh, 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 in a radical, in a dichotomous manner. Right? Um, and in biology, these are called uh, clines. So most phenotypes vary in a clinal manner. It's a continuous gra gradient of variation. Now, it bears on how to define race because, well, where are you going to put the threshold? Uh, are you going to define as black people, people whose hue, uh, whose skin tone is really on the darker side? So are you going to count people in North of Africa as being black? Where is the distinction? Where is the, thre is the threshold? Right? There's no obvious way of distinguishing uh, people into black and white based on this continuous gradient of, of variation. And the third reason why it's really difficult to define races by looking at the phenotype is the fact that 
the traits which are racialized, the traits, the features which we associate with races, like skin color, body type, nose type, lips type, the type of hair, te hair texture, all these traits, all these features change in a way which is independent of one another. Now let me explain. Let's suppose we want to define races by means of skin color, right? as many people would want to do. If we do so, we, will, we may try to include only people with really dark skin within the same race, which will include a large part of Africa, the Indian continent, and part of, of Australia, the aborigines in Australia. Right? That would be a single race based on their skin. But now, let's, let's suppose we want to look also at the shape of the nose, at the shape of the facial features. What we would see is that the people we've been including in that single race would have very different facial features. Right? So the nose, for example, of many people in India, like Nehru, for example, the nose of uh, aborigines in, in Australia, or of people in East Africa have different, very different shape. Right? There's no single facial feature that would be shared by all these people with the same skin color. However, if we try to classify people by looking at their facial features, then these people will have very different skin color. Right? So when you take one trait to classify people into races, you have one kind, but then people look very different. They have different faces, different body, different type of hair within that group. If you take the nose to classify people, then people will have different skin color within that group. So these traits are orthogonal to one another. They change in an independent manner. Right? All right. So we've seen three reasons why it's very difficult to use, uh, it's very difficult to use a phenotype to classify people into uh, races. So the idea is, well, racial groups, you know, it, it seems that we can use the way people look, their skin colors, the type of their face, their hair texture, to distinguish them into races. But then when we look at the details, it's much harder, right? For three reasons, there's an enormous amount of variation within a race. There's a continuous variation, right? And the third reason is that the traits which we associate with race, the racialized traits, vary independently of one another, right? Now, at this point, you may say, well, that's fine. It's all about the phenotypes. But really, what matters at the end of the day is genes. Right? What matters at the end of the day is genetic variation and whether we can make sense of the way humans' genome varies by means of their race. And that's going to be the topic of the next uh, three uh, sections. The first thing I want to do is just to refresh your uh, memory about uh, 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 genetics. Really very simple thing. Don't be offended. I just don't know who I was talking to, so I just wanted to uh, uh, put a few, define a few notions uh, before looking at the details. As you know, humans have 23 chromo pairs of chromosomes. 22 of them are called autosomal. They are uh, uh, non-sexual, and two of them, two chromosomes, one pair of chromosomes is uh, sexual chromosomes. A chromosome is made of a DNA, which is this long uh, uh, molecule here. And here's the first important point you need to remember. A DNA has this uh, structure here. And between this structure, what you have is what are known as nucleotides, which form base pairs. And you've got four types of nucleotides. Right? So here's a base pair, here's a base pair, here's a base pair, here's a base pair with two nucleotides by, by, best, by best pair. All right, so far so good. How, you have four billion, four billion best pair, so really a lot, four billion best pair in a human genome. All right? Remember that number, four billion. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. A gene is just a, 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 a part of a chromosome, a stretch of DNA, that is coding for a protein, right? That is involved in creating a protein. In humans, you have about 30,000 genes, right? And here is, just to refresh your memory, uh, the process of uh, protein coding. So DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into 
into uh, protein. Okay, here's a second point which is going to be important for the remainder of, of the lecture. As you know, genes are located uh, in, at some place on the chromosome. And the place where they're located is called a locus. And the plural is loci. Right? So the plural is called a lo uh, uh, locus loci. So that's a place on a chromosome where a gene is located. Any given gene can have many versions, many variants. Right? And a variant of a gene is called an allele. Right? So here, for example, you have, two, you have at, at this locus here, you have two distinct alleles, alleles two distinct versions of of that genes, right? The notion here which really matters is the notion of an allele. And what are alleles? Well, you have an allele when some of the base pairs of uh, uh, a gene have been replaced by other base pairs, right? So that could be a stretch of DNA. It makes up a gene. And what you have here is in some people, GC, has been replaced by AT. So you have another version of the same gene. You have two alleles, allele one, allele two. All right? That should be really simple. Now, an important, uh, the third piece of information you need to remember is the notion of non-coding DNA. As I said, um, um, uh, you know, you've got, uh, the human genome includes four billion base pairs. It's quite a lot, but most of it is actually non-coding. So 98% of the genome is not involved in producing proteins. Only 2% of the human genome is involved in, cre in creating proteins. So most of the human genome does something else. Part of it does nothing. It's called junk DNA. We don't really know why it's there. Right? Part of it is involved in regulating the creation of proteins, but it's not involved directly in protein making, and so on and so forth. So a large part of the human genome is non-coding uh, non DNA. OK, so that's the third idea you need to remember for the remainder of the lecture. All right, three ideas we've seen. Now, uh, uh, four billion base pairs, large number. Uh, the notion of, of an allele, as you, I'm sure you were very familiar with that. And only 2% of the genome is involved in coding. 98% is not. Right. Uh, that's just uh, a bit of background. Now, what I want, the question I want to ask is, remember the way the lecture is going. We start with the idea, are races biological? And you say, well, they seem to be, right, based on a phenomenology, based on the fact that races are used in, in medicine, based on the debate in science. Then we look at the history. Well, racial classification have been changing a lot across time. Right? Then we look at how to define races by means of the phenotype. And it looks very difficult right? for three reasons. We've seen that. At this point, the next move is, well, maybe we should look at the genes. Maybe if we want to understand why we can distinguish people in two races, it's when we're going to look at people's genome. Right? That's where we are in the lecture. And the first thing to say is, well, by and large, Human beings are the same from a genetic point of view. As you know, if you compare a human being and a chimpanzee, right, that's Jane Goodell, one of the most uh, uh, famous chimpanzee researchers, and we're almost the same. We share 99% of our base pairs, 99% of our genome with chimpanzee. So basically, you take me, not chimpanzee very much, no. I, you know, I, I can give lectures, chimpanzees can't. And then you take a chimpanzee, and then you look at my genome, and at a chimpanzee's genome, and it's almost the same. 99% of my genome is shared by, by a chimpanzee. What about two human beings? Let's say we take randomly one person in the US, her, and one person in uh, uh, China or, or Japan, whatever, and we look how different their genome is, right? And here's what you're going to find. They share 99% of their genome. So when you take two individuals randomly across the world, 99.9% .9 of their genome is identical, right? I take two people in that room randomly, 
And I look at your genome, and I see, well, man, 99.9% is identical. What does that really mean, just to give you a sense? Well, here's what it really means. You take, you know, I open your body, I take the cell, you know, I take the chromosome, I stretch the chromosome, I look at the nucleotides, the, be the uh, uh, base pair, right? And I take 1,000 1, of them. Only one of them out of 1,000 is going to be different between two people taken randomly in the world. I mean, it's really minute. It's really a very small proportion, right? By and large, any two human being is almost identical from a genetic point of view. Now, what you may ask at this point is, OK, fine, one out of 1,000. It does not seem very much. But is it really much, or is it little? It's hard to say, right? I mean, you know, one out of 1,000, it's just a number. What we really want to know is to have comparison points. What we want to be able to, to do is to compare human beings with other species. Here is one way to go about doing that. Human being, one out of 1,000 base pairs is going to vary across human beings. Chimpanzees, or closest relatives, right, one out of 500. So there's twice as much variation in chimpanzees compared to human beings. Much more variation in chimpanzees. Now you may say, OK, but maybe I've been cherry picking my example. Maybe there's a lot of variation in chimpanzees. Maybe if we've been looking at other species, we would have found even less variation than in human beings. So what you have here is a slide by Alan Templeton, published in 1998, where what he does, he looks at the, the amount of genetic variation in mammalian species, in mammals, which are in some ways similar to human beings because they can move all over the world, right? Uh, Woofs and that kind of things. And what you can see is that for most mammals, their genetic variation is larger and sometimes much larger than for human beings, right? So for most mammals, uh, there's much more variation at the level of the gene than for human beings. Again, the, we, we, we see the same point coming again and again. Human beings are quite distinct in the human world in that, from a genetic point of view, people are really similar to one another, much more than chimpanzees, much more than wolves, much more than many other mammals. And that fits with the basic idea I want to sell you, right? That if you look at the biology, there's no reason to distinguish humans into races, right? There's no ground because from a genetic point of view, we are all the same, right? Again, that's what I just said. Compared to other species, there is little genetic variation in, in humans. In addition, remember I told you that 98% of the DNA is non-coding. It's not involved in creating proteins. Much of the genetic variation is, in fact, taking place in part of the genome that does nothing. That's not coding, right? So not only there is very little genetic variation between people, but a large part, what there is is often in part of the genome that's junk, that just does nothing whatsoever, right? So the little genetic variation there is is meaningless from a biological point of view. Some of it, of course, is going to be in coding parts of the genome. That's why we have different skin colors, right? So it's not like there's nothing. But part of the genetic variation is in things that play no role in, in, in biology. What's the upshot? Well, the first lesson, from a genetic point of view, human beings are fundamentally identical, right? Now, you may object that, well, two human beings differ by three billion pair bases. It's a lot. So it means that uh, two human, uh, in any human being, there is three billion uh, 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 base pairs. So it means that two randomly selected individuals are going to differ by three million base pairs, right? That's still quite a lot. So maybe even so there is little genetic variation Maybe the genetic variation there is is enough 
to distinguish people into races. Maybe when we look at these three million places where there are differences between people, maybe these ones are going to be good enough to distinguish races from a biological point of view. Right? And that's going to be the object of uh, the next uh, section. So the goal of the next section is find as little genetic variation between people. We are basically all the same from a genetic point of view. But still there is some. And could we distinguish races by looking at this small amount of genetic variation? Now, I said earlier that part of the lecture is the only one which is going to be a little bit technical. Uh, there will even be a mathematical formula. Uh, so hopefully, uh, I, I, won't, I won't lose you. The first thing I want to do is to step back and explain the idea of apportioning diversity between groups. Let's suppose we look at height. Right? And we look at two populations, Dutch people and the AFA, which used to be called as pygmies, but pygmies is a European term. It's partly offensive, so the AFA. Uh, it's only one of the pygmy groups. Well, Dutch people are really tall. I mean, they're really, uh, when you travel in Europe, you, you know, they're really, really tall people. The average height for a Dutch person is, Dutch man, is 6.1 feet, which is, which is really, really, uh, really, really high. By contrast, the AFA are actually quite small, 4.9. Right? So that's a situation where a large part of the genetic variation, uh, the height variation, the variation in height, is between groups. Right? So if I tell you that individual is an AFA, well, immediately you know a lot about his or her height, right? In contrast, if I tell you, uh, uh, or if I tell you she's not an AFA but she's a Dutch, well, then you know really a lot about his or her height, right? Because the, the two populations are very different from one another, right? So much of the variation in height is between populations. Contrast that first case to, that, to this second case. Now we're looking at the Dutch still, 6.1, and we're comparing them to the Germans, 6. In that case, much of the variation is within races, not between, ra uh, within countries, populations, not uh, uh, between populations, right? If I tell you, look, Mark, you know, he's German, not Dutch, or he's Dutch, not German. That's not very much information because the two curves, as you can see here, almost overlaps perfectly. Right? It says nothing to give you some information, or very little, to tell you which country someone comes from in that case. Right? So that's a situation where much of the variation in height is within populations, not between populations. So what we want to ask, the question we want to ask is, what about genetic variation, genetic diversity? Is it more like that, where much of the variation is between races? Right? In the same way as when you look at the AFA and the Dutch, much of the variation in height is between races, not within races? Or is it more like that, where much of the variation is within races? Right? When, you, when you look at the German and, and the Dutch, well, much of the variation in height is within the population, not between the populations. Right? What about genes? More like that or more like this? It's going to get a little bit more technical, so let me just give you the tech home message. It's like that. Right? So much of the genetic variation is within races, not between races. Right? So the, the story is, look, human beings are almost the same from a genetic point of view. There is some variation. Some variation is not coding, it's junk, does nothing, so it's not meaningful from a biological point of view. So variation that is meaningful, it's really within races, not between races. Right? All right, now let's try, let's try to unpack that claim. So first difficulty is that for height, we are talking about a continuous trait. It's a quantitative trait, right? 6.1, 6.2, 4.9. It's a con people vary in height in a continuous manner. Now, when one, look, one is looking at gene, one is not looking at a continuous trait. What we're going to be looking at is that we're going to take a specific gene, right? 
And we are going to look at its alleles, its variants, and we are going to look at the frequencies of its alleles. So for example, if you look at these three, uh, three alleles, A1, A2, and A3, for a specific gene in a specific population, one allele, its frequency will be 60%, another one, th the second allele, the frequency will be 30%, and the last one, its frequency will be 10%. And we're going to use frequencies to capture the idea of variation within population, within races, and across races. How does that work? Well, here is a very simple example to help you follow the point. We've got one gene with two alleles, A1 and A2, right? And two population, population one and population two. Now, let's look first at this diagram. In population one, 60% of people have, have uh, allele one, 40% of people have allele two. In population two, 60% of people have allele one, and 40% of people have allele two. In that case, all the variation is within population. Right? There's no difference between the two populations. The frequencies are the same. Right? Everybody get that? So frequencies of the two alleles are the same in the two populations. So all the variation is within the population. It's not between the population. That's the other extreme case. In population one, everybody has allele one. So there's no variation within population one. In population two, everybody has allele two. So there's no variation within population two. In that case, there's no within population variation. All the variation is between populations. Right? So we've got a case here where all the variation is within population, a case here where all the variation is between populations, and a case here which is in the inter which is in between, right? Here, population one, 60 for allele one, 40 for allele two. In population two, 30 or 70, 30. In population two, 40 and 60. Right? There's both within and between variation here. Right? So everybody gets how that works a little bit, how to uh, look at frequencies and to look at uh, within and population, between population diversity. Now, we want, to do this, we want to do exactly that for races and for many many genes. The first person who did it is uh, Richard Lewontin in uh, the most important paper ever written about races called The uh, Apportionment of Human Diversity, published in 1972 in Evolutionary Biology. In that very important, very influential paper, Lewontin looks at uh, human genetic diversity and he does what we just did, except he does it in a more mathematical way, and it shows that, by and large, we are in that case, except that the di distinction between races is really, really tiny. Right? I will, I will, what I will do is I will walk you through the paper now. How am I doing on time, please? I'm fine. OK. So the goal of Lewontin is to examine whether the frequencies of the alleles which are involved in blood types are roughly the same across races, right? which would mean that much of the variation is within races, not between races. Right? So you take the genes involved in blood types, the alleles, and you look at the frequency of the various alleles across races. And you see whether that's the same frequencies across races. If that's the same, then it means that much of the variation is within races, not between races. Or you look at whether the frequencies are different across races. If they are different across races, it means that much of the variation is between races, not within races. So that's the starting point of uh, um, uh, Lewontin. So what Lewontin does is he looked, did is look at 17 genes involved in blood types. You got the list right there. And that's the alleles he uh, focused on. And what you have here is the frequencies of the alleles and the extreme population. So for example, aptoglobin, he looked at this allele, and it varies from 0.09, so 9% of the population among the Tamil, to 92% of the population among the Lacondon, right? and so on for all 
the other genes. He looked then at more than 100 populations, 100 countries, right, which he divided into seven races, white, Caucasians, black Africans, people of Asian origin, what he called Mongoloids for some reason, South Asian Aborigines, people, uh, Native Americans and Indians in, in America, uh, Pacific Islander, Oceanians, and Australian Aborigines. So you've got populations here, right? And these populations are classified into seven races, right? So we've got a list of 17 genes with the various alleles for each gene, right? And we've got 100 populations classified into seven races. So far, so good? The next thing he did is, and that's the formula I told you I was going to give you, he defines a measure of diversity, a, a measure that tries to capture how much variation you have in a population. Okay? And this uh, measure is, is uh, a well-known measure, it's a shadow information measure, which for a given population is computed as follows. Let's suppose we're looking at one gene in a population. The gene has two alleles, two versions, two variants. It's going to be the frequency of the first allele times the logarithm base 2 of the frequency of the first allele plus the frequency of the second allele times the logarithm base 2 of the frequency of the second allele. Right? And that sum gives you a measure of how much diversity there is. Let me just uh, illustrate that by an example. We have that population here. And we're looking at one gene. It has three alleles, A1, A2, A3. So the frequency of A1 is 60%. The frequency of A2 is 30%. The frequency of A3 is 10%. How much is H1, the measure of diversity? Well, it's 0 0.6, 0 0.6 times the logarithm base 2 of 0 0.6 plus 0.3 times the logarithm base 2 of 0.3 plus 0.1 times the logarithm base 2 of 0.1. And that gives you uh, a measure of how much diversity you have in population one. Now, if you've got that population here, population two, three genes, three alleles of the same genes, they're all 33 percent, right? So you're going to have H2 here is going to be times uh, 0 0.33, 0, 0 0.33 times logarithm base two of 0.33, and so on and so forth, right? And you could apply, of course, the same idea for a population where instead of having three alleles, you would have four alleles. Everybody gets how that works? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not really, really difficult. Now, intuitively, and more than intuitively, there's more genetic variation here than here. Why? Well, because here, most people have the same gene, right? So you, you know, if, you bet on a, if you bet on one gene on A1, you're more likely to get it right. Here, there's a lot of genetic variation because there's a, um, um, you know, there's no gene for which most people have that gene, right? And you get the right results. You get, in fact, H1, which measures genetic diversity here, is smaller than H2, which measures gen genetic diversity here, and it's smaller than H3, which would measure the genetic diversity here, right? So we, what we have here is a measure of how much diversity you have. I gave you the formula try to give you a sense of how it works. So details, mathematical details don't really, really matter, but you should get a sense of how that works. All right, what uh, Lewontin did then is to compute a few things. And let me walk you slowly through what he did. The first thing is that he computed H, remember he's got 100 population, for white people, French, Italian, and so on and so forth, right? So for each population, is going to compute H. What's the amount of diversity for a gene among French people? And then it's going to do the same thing for Italians and so on and so forth. Right? And then for a given race, sorry, white people, is going to compute the average diversity, which is going to be here, for example, for that gene, aptoglobin, equal to 0.912. OK? So you take all the white populations. For each of them, you compute the H, and then you compute the mean H for the population, right? The first thing he did. Then he looked at the average frequency of the allele among white people, 
And he did compute, based on that average frequency, the edge value for white people. Right? So you just take the white people as a population, you take the average frequency of the allele, and then you compute H for white people. Right? So you've got two measures. You've got the average H for all the white populations, and you've got the H for the white people. Right? Now, let's suppose that all white population, French people, Italian people, uh, uh, German people, Let's suppose that the frequencies of the alleles are the same in each white population. 60, 40, for example, in, in French, 60, 40 in German, 60, 40 in Italian, 60, 40 in British. The frequencies are all the same in all white populations. Right? Then, if that were the case, these two numbers here should be identical. So any difference between these two numbers, right, or the fact that the ratio is not equal to 1, any difference between these two numbers means that population make a small difference from a genetic point of view. Right? OK. Uh, and what it does then is move from a specific race to the human species in general and all races. Right? So he computes the average frequency of the alleles for the human species in general, and compute the amount of diversity for the human species in general. Then he computes the average variation across the seven races. Right? So he takes these numbers here, how much variation there is in white, how much variation there is in African, how much variation there is in Asian, and he computes the mean of all these numbers, which is that. And then let's suppose that race means nothing from a genetic point of view. Let's suppose that the frequencies of alleles are all the same in white, in Africans, in Asians, in, uh, 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 in Aborigines, in Pacific Islander. If the frequencies of alleles are all the same, then that number should be equal to that number. Right? The more different these two numbers are, the more races are meaningful from a biological point of view. Right, that's a key idea. The more different these two numbers are, the more meaningful race is from a genetic point of view. And to just jump in, what you see here when you look at this colon is a measure of the difference between that, a measure of the difference that race makes. How much race matter to capture diversity? Right? And what you can see is the answer is almost not. Ve the two numbers we've seen, H species and H race, are for, all, for the seven genes, 17 genes that Lewontin is looking at, they're almost always identical. And to summarize, the main finding here is that on average, races capture only 6% of the genetic variation, right? which basically means that from a, you know, we, sta we started by the idea, look, People all over the world are genetically the same. There is very little genetic variation. The genetic variation there is often is meaningless. But even the genetic variation is not well captured by races. Right? It's not distributed between the races. It's distributed within, uh, distributed within the races. So what does it mean? Well, here is really what it means. It means that in general, not always, there are a few exceptions. Allele frequency, so the frequency of various alleles for a given gene, is roughly similar, also not exactly identical, across races. Right? You take a gene, you look at its alleles, you look at the frequencies of its alleles for white people, then you look at black people, you will have roughly the same frequency for black people. You look at Asian, you will have roughly the same frequencies for Asian people, and so on and so forth. So the frequencies are roughly similar across races. To, give, to illustrate this idea, what you have here is uh, as a genotype for a specific gene with, on the one hand, Asian, and on the other hand, uh, Europeans. And as you can see, the frequencies of the genotypes are very, very similar. Right? You look at the European frequencies, then you turn to Asian, it's roughly the same frequencies. 
right? Which it, and that's exactly the point about diversity being within races and across races, right? So various versions, the various alleles or the various genotypes have the same frequencies across all the races. So talking about races say very little because if you look at white, if you look at black, you will find the same, or Asian, you will look the same frequencies of all the alleles of, of a given gene. That's what it means. What it does not mean, there's often some confusion about what they want in did show. So what it shows is, in general, the frequencies of alleles are the same in all the races. What it did not show is that they're identical, right? They're similar. They need not be exactly identical. And what it did not show either is that there are no private allele. A private allele is an allele that is found only in one population, in one race. Right? There can be plenty, and there are plenty of private alleles. But these private alleles, when you find one, they're very rare. They're very uncommon. So you're going to find a very weird mutant, a very weird version in some white family. Right? which you're not going to find among black people, among Asians. But it's just going to be really rare, really uncommon among white people. Right? So you will find plenty of alleles which in some races but not in others. But when you find that, these alleles are going to be very rare in the race where you found them. So what you're not going to find, what you're never going to find, or very rarely, is a gene for which one allele is very common among one race and very rare in another race. Right? That's a situation that we do not find in the biological world, right? a case where there's a, a version of a gene that's common among white people, but very rare among black people or among Asians. Right? That's really what is not found in the biological world. You may say, well, but uh, Lewontin just looked at blood types. What about other genes? Now, a Lewontin study has been done for many other genes, and you always find the same, the same story. Here's a review looking at a bunch of other genes. And what you can see is, again and again, race explains only 6% to 10% of the genetic variation. Only a very minute proportion of genetic diversity is explained or captured by, by races. What's the upshot? Not only are human beings nearly identical from a genetic point of view, we've seen that in the previous section of the lecture, <laughs> but much of the small amount of genetic variation is in fact found within races rather than across races, rather than between races. So there's almost no genetic variation, and what there is is actually within races, not between races. What should we conclude from that? Well, I think it's hard to put it better than what Lewontin concluded at the end of his very famous and very important paper. Here's what Lewontin says. Human racial classification is of no social value. So he had a normative claim about human, ra racial classifications are bad for society. And is positively destructive of social and human relations. Since such racial classification is now seen to be of virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance either. No justification can be offered for its continuance. Right, the conclusion that Lewontin drew from that kind of work is we should stop entirely classifying people into races. There's just no biological justification for it. And from a social point of view, it's harmful rather than helpful to classify people into races. OK, I want to uh, very briefly mention two other points about genetic diversity something that maybe some of you do not know and that you should know. So the first thing I want to mention is, if you look at uh, uh, human genetic diversity, as I said earlier, we're almost all the same, right? Only one base pair out of 1,000. But if you look at where people in the world are more diverse from a genetic point of view, it's going to be in Africa, right? So the greatest diversity in uh, uh, genetics is actually in Africa. African people are more diverse from a genetic point of view than people in any other race. Right? More genetic variation among Africans than in any other race. The second point I wanted to make is, uh, again, if you look at the genetic variation in Africa and you compare to the genetic variation in 
let's say, Native American and Indians, white people, Asian people. So genetic variations that you find in other races, white, uh, uh, white, Asian, and so on and so forth, is a subset of the genetic variation that you find in, Afri in Africa. Right? So you've got more variation in Africa than, any than anywhere else, and the genetic variations that you find in Asia is in fact only a subset, it's only part of the genetic variation that you find in, uh, that you find in, in Africa. All right, let me conclude uh, that, uh, that section uh, by just the idea that we've seen two things that we really should remember. From a genetic point of view, you guys are all the same, so you can be friends and forget about your hatred and all that kind of things. Uh, and the small amount of genetic variation there is, is within races, not across races. What that means is, when you look at any gene, at the frequencies of the alleles, look at white, then look at black, the frequencies of the alleles are going to be nearly identical. Right? There's no real difference between, between uh, the frequencies of various alleles. Right? Again, it just means that it's hard to make sense from a biological point of view of why we would want to use racial classification. Right? They don't seem to capture anything at the genetic level. Very briefly, I want to explain to you why it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. As you know, we know now that we are a single species. It was debated until the 19th century, right? but now it's, it's of course not debated. We are all a single species, but we're also a very recent species. Human beings, Homo sapiens, only emerged 200,000 year, 200, years ago, 160,000 years ago. It's really short for a species. You know, from an evolutionary point of view, it's a blimp. That explains why there is very little genetic variation among human beings. The fact that we're a recent species, you know, we, we've been around for really a short period of time. And uh, it's one of the reasons, not the only one, it's one of the reasons why we haven't, more, we haven't diverged, right? We just, uh, uh, you know, uh, we evolved and then, you know, we didn't have that much time to diverge from one another, right? So it does explain, it's one of the reasons, not the only one, one of the reasons why uh, the recent origins of human beings explain the low amount of genetic diversity among human beings. Another one is that if you look at the evolution, at the spread of human beings out of Africa, what happens roughly is human beings as we know them emerge from a small population in East Africa, and this small population spread in two directions. It spread, it spread through Africa, towards the west of Africa, the south of Africa, and then it spread all over the world. First in the Middle East, towards Europe, then in Asia, then a branch went to uh, uh, Pacific Island and uh, uh, Australia, then to the north through uh, 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 Bering, North America, South America. The crucial point here is we started from a small population and then we spread throughout the world. Now, that phenomenon explains two things. It does explain why, again, there are very little genetic variation among human beings, why we're all the same from a genetic point of view because our ancestors all come from the same small population, right? So we all have uh, uh, our ancestors 160,000 years ago come from a population with 10,000, 20,000 individuals in East Africa. Of course, that explains why there's so little genetic variation. The second reason is it does explain why the variation you find in Asia, in Europe, in North America is a subset of the variation you find in, in Africa. Why? Because out of these 10, 20 people in uh, uh, East Africa 200,000 years ago, only a subset went out of Africa. So they took only part of the genes right, that were present in the population at the time. Right? And so only a small subset of the variation existing at the time was exported to the rest of the world. So the variation we now find in Asia, in Europe, in America is a subset of the variation that was part of the pool 200,000 years ago. Right? So what we know about the evolution of human beings makes sense of what we know also of the genetic diversity among human beings nowadays. And I will conclude now, because it's my, my time is, is over, uh, just the upshot is that the evolution of the human species explains why races are not genetically more distinct. Let me conclude and summarize. There are five things that you should be remembering from this lecture. 
So first one is that, well, racial classifications vary across times. You know, the way we classify races these days, it's really parochial. It does not generalize to other places and other times. So very likely, it's not biologically grounded. The second point is that it's very hard to distinguish races on the basis of phenotypic traits like skin colors for three reasons. The first one is that those traits vary within races. The second one is that the variation is continuous, so it's hard to draw a boundary between races. The third one is because racialized traits vary independently of one another. Skin color and racial feature, they don't vary in the same way among human beings. The third point you need to remember is that there is very little vari genetic variation among human beings. From a, genetic, from a genetic point of view, we are nearly identical. The first point you need to remember, the existing genetic variation occurs within races, not between them, which means that alleles very rarely, almost never, occur at high frequency in a race and at low frequency in another race. Right? The frequencies are the same across races. And the last point you need to remember is that the amount and apportionment of genetic variation uh, makes sense in light of the evolution of the human species. Conclusion, the division of human beings into distinct races, black, white, Asians, cannot be justified on, on biological grounds. Thank you.